Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Um, as Dean of the Faculty of Design, it's my honor to welcome you to the 2018 Class Day Speaker and Commencement Award Ceremony of the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Now, now, now. Great day for it. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of the families and friends of our graduating students. It's wonderful to have so many of you here supporting them. Like previous years, this year has been an enormously exciting and productive year for our students, as evidenced by the exhibition that most of you have just seen, uh, their work in the Drucker Design Gallery. Each of our graduates whether in one of the three departments or in the design studies, design engineering, or the doctoral programs, has devoted an enormous amount of time and commitment to developing their ideas and to attain the level of achievement necessary for graduation. The work of our students would not have been possible without a careful and intensive curriculum developed and taught by our faculty and supported by our dedicated staff. The course of study at the GSD has enabled our students to encounter knowledge that contributes to society at large and is at the forefront of their chosen fields. Beyond the curriculum, the quality of our graduates' work relies on their intellectual interactions with a wide range of faculty within the context of the GSD and across Harvard whose academic and administrative staff create and maintain a productive and stimulating atmosphere for reimagining the relationship between design and the built environment. Today, we will recognize and acknowledge the students who in their time here at the GSD have made outstanding contributions to their chosen area of study. We know that our graduates will go on to make significant contributions, not only to the quality of life of citizens across the globe, but also to the design disciplines. At this time, Class Marshal Brian Ho, who will be receiving one of the school's first Master in Design Engineering degrees tomorrow, will introduce our Class Day speaker, Paolo Antonelli. Please welcome Brian. Thank you, Dean Mustafavi, and uh, good morning to everyone. I'm honored to introduce Paola Antonelli as our 2018 Class Day speaker. Paola Antonelli joined the Museum of Modern Art in 1994 and is a senior curator in the Department of Architecture and Design, as well as the founding director of research and development at MoMA. Paola has, for more than two decades, expanded, celebrated, and broadened design and design's influence through both an incredible knowledge and curiosity for design and individual effort. Her early 1995 exhibition at MoMA, Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design, was innovative for not only allowing visitors to touch and interact with physical samples of new materials, such as composites and resins, but also for featuring MoMA's first website, which Paola herself coded in HTML. In countless landmark exhibitions since, Paola has brilliantly defined a progressive and responsive design we now take for granted. Design that influences with complexity, converses with the sciences and humanities, engages with new technology, and embraces a responsibility to society. As curator, she has staged exhibitions interrogating the ideas of risk, violence, and stress, reminders that not all design is comfortable, nor is it easy. She has also led MoMA to acquire the at symbol, the Google Maps pin, and video games such as Pac-Man, not only as designed objects, but as acknowledgment of the ever-growing impact of design through interaction across the digital and physical. Paolo has a master's degree in architecture from the Polytechnic of Milan, and has also earned honorary doctorate degrees from the Royal College of Art and Kingston University London, the Art Center College of Design Pasadena, and the Pratt Institute in New York. She has lectured worldwide, served on critical international architecture and design juries, and was awarded the 2015 AIGA Medal. She can be found on Twitter as @CuriousOctopus, which is an amazing account, and I encourage everyone here to follow. 
I'm also proud to say that Palo sits on the external advisory board for our own master in design engineering program at the GSD and C's. In speaking with Paula, I have been greatly inspired by her passion, and I'm hopeful that all of us can practice the kind of design, interdisciplinary, empowered, and provocative, that she has so tirelessly and insightfully championed. Please join me in welcoming our 2018 Class Day speaker, Paula Antonelli. Thank you so much, Ryan, for such a wonderful, wonderful introduction. But first and foremost, congratulations, class of 2018. You've been great. I am so happy to be here talking with you. And you know, even though uh, today I will say I many, many times, I will say I meaning you, meaning us, meaning they, I was there and I am still there in the trenches with you. So I'll poke fun at myself. I'll tell you a little bit of my troubles and vicissitudes of my career because I hope that it will let you know that I've been there also with you, and that you can learn a little bit from my mistakes, perhaps, and also from my hopes and dreams and fears. And it's a real privilege to be speaking to you today, because you're the brilliant minds and hands and stomachs of tomorrow. And I'm really in awe of you. I've always been in awe of the students of this wonderful school. I taught here the first time about 15 years ago. And uh, I did it for a few years, then it was too hard to schlep from New York to Boston once a week. So I gave it up for a while, and then the habit came back about three years ago when I took a sabbatical from MoMA and I came back for one semester. And I've always been in awe, I've always been in great admiration. I've also been irritated because I've been humbled. I don't like to be humbled, I'm sorry to say, but that has happened many, many times. And that's why I find it really a privilege and an honor to be here today. And why am I here today? I've been thinking about it. I think, okay, I have a nice accent. Yeah, I have, I'm a woman. I also, I used to teach here. Also, I use the same non-denominational uh, idea and term for design that the GSD uses. To me, design is everything. It is fashion, it is video games, and it's also architecture. You know, this is like, really doesn't fly that much amongst architects, but I believe that architecture is a branch of design. And uh, also, despite having studied architecture, I speak in extroverted, comprehensible, and semi-logical sentences. And, uh, and despite having studied architecture, I found a pleasant and instantly gratifying profession. So I guess that's why I'm here. I'm inspiring you to continue. But seriously speaking, I believe that design, design that also embraces architecture, is tremendous. And it's a, an incredible force that is still kind of unexplored in the world at large. We know its value and its importance, but the world is getting to catch up with us uh, little by little. It's a force for political and social change. It's a force for evolution, for progress, for growth, and for improvement. We know it very well. And it's up to us to explain it to the rest of the world. You know, sometimes we, we kind of complain because we feel that the world doesn't really understand that designers are not beautifiers, that architects are not just making big buildings, but really are building the fabric of society. But it's up to us to make our voice heard, find the language, find the metrics. Sometimes we miss the metrics, and so people don't really know how to use us in, in stump speeches if they're politicians. It's up to us to really make our voices heard. And I believe that one of the first steps is to embrace this continuum that Harvard has embraced. To make sure that architecture, landscape, urban planning are enmeshed with art, with products, with engineering, taking advantage of the whole campus, contaminating architecture and design with economics, with law, with all the other amazing offerings, let's call them offerings, that are on the menu at Harvard. It's wonderful to see Harvard straddling dimensions and scales of application of design. So I want to also congratulate from the deep of my heart, the new MDE grads. So you're the first ones. Congratulations. You know, we need to realize how privileged we are to be able to follow our passions. 
there's so many people in the world that cannot realize their dreams, and instead we are well posited here to be able to do so. I work in one of the most important institutions in the world. You are graduating from one of the most important institutions in the world. That puts us in the leading seat to be able to actually make things uh, change and to really be actuating some improvement. And we should never forget that privilege. We should make it to good use. I realize now that architects are underemployed very often because uh, they're not used enough in the world, for instance, of video games or interfaces. You know, I find it really interesting when there was a crisis in 2008 and so many construction sites stopped, many architects understood that their spatial savvy was really, really important in the digital realm and therefore almost seamlessly moved into a new world and created new spaces and a new way for us to inhabit it. It's so important to have that flexibility and that intelligence. You know, this year is the 10th anniversary of an exhibition called Design and the Elastic Mind that uh, we organized at MoMA that was about design and science coming together. And it was an exhibition in which we really understood that scientists need designers and designers need scientists because there's the possibility of dreaming without being burdened by peer review that scientists find in design. And designers are happy because they can help scientists envision the possible applications of their work. So designers and architects have gained power, but they can gain much more of it. We need to find a way to have leverage. You know, as always in any negotiation, it's about leverage. And we were hearing before how many architects and designers are starting to work with political entities and are really starting to work with government. It could be even more so. We have to find our language, and that language could be numbers, or it could be the power of empirical demonstration. And I believe that you are just at the forefront of this kind of demonstration that will happen surely and soon in the outside world. I know it firsthand because I have these fond memories of teaching here at Harvard. I had all of these encounters with the passion and commitment and talent and also honesty of the students here. For instance, I remember a seminar that I taught here in 2004 about design and safety. I was preparing an exhibition at MoMA about safety. It was called Safe Design Takes on Risk. And I had an amazing class of not too many students, maybe 15, but coming truly from all over the world. And the beginning of the class was um, an exercise that was really difficult and at the same time wonderful. We went around the class and we all said out loud what made us scared, the thing that would make us feel unsafe. And the class was so diverse that what made people unsafe turned out to be an incredible uh, series of sometimes stereotypes, but other times really heartfelt uh, and deep acknowledgments. For instance, um, there was a wonderful student, Republican from the Bible Belt, that said, I fear the hatred that comes from so many of my uh, colleagues because I don't have the same beliefs. Or there, was, there were two students from Persia that said, we fear beards because they immediately bring us home. And they bring us home in a way that is really uncomfortable. A student from the Bronx that said, I fear scaffoldings. I don't want to go under scaffoldings. And we based the whole seminar on this fear that were at the same time personal and visceral, but also were uh, a mirror of other people like them. This kind of honesty is always something that I respect. It's not enough to be talented and intelligent. In order to effectuate change in the world, one also has to have soul and have the ability to carry that soul into their work. And fear is also important. I wanted to talk to you about fear. You know, I remember that I was teaching that seminar in a sea lion position because I was having back problems. And so I was talking about my fears from this very weird angle. And I gave my students a presentation about fear. I was thinking of the other times in my life where I was really fearful, and I'm sure that you experienced them a lot. Um, one time in particular that I think was 
quite uh, a beautiful teaching, a lesson for me, was when I was a young journalist, I was about 24, and I got my very first big interview with Frank Gehry. I was coming from Milan, and I was, of course, going through New York because there was no direct flight, and then I got to Los Angeles, and I rented a car, and I was like the big California, the Pacific Ocean. I felt so free and so light, and I bought a new tape recorder, beautiful tape recorder, voice-operated recorder. I tested it. I bought these new tapes, and I put the stickers on, and I wrote already they were all prepared, and I, I got to Cloverfield Boulevard because that's where the studio used to be, and and with fear and panic in my heart, because that's how it always is, I pushed the button. You know, that pushing of the button is really the moment. I pushed the button, I went upstairs, I was like a sparrow, right? So, and uh, here I am with Frank Gehry, I sat down and a two hour interview, it was fantastic, and then I really ran downstairs, I was almost flying, I got into my car, I was so happy, I took out the recorder and I pushed the button to hear the interview, nothing. The voice-operated recording became active only when the voice spoke, but the air conditioning in the office had created white noise and nothing was recorded. In that moment of full panic, something, somebody, not me, it must have been me, but I didn't know that me, got out of the car, pushed the button again, went upstairs, told Frank Gehry what had happened, and Frank Gehry gave me the interview again. That goes to tell you, I know, that's Frank, that I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I learned that even though you're just dying of fear, you better go and try to get what you've lost if you make a mistake, number one. And number two, I learned the importance of generosity. And this is really what I wanted also to tell you. These kind of generous acts continue for a lifetime. And it's a lifetime of mentoring and of trying to really be um, a good boss to people that work with me and a good colleague to people that work with me that is not gonna end, it's never gonna end. But I have to say also that this kind of generosity, if you can implement it, and it's not like I can do it all the time, I can be really horrible many times, Don't, I'm painting this angel-like figure, but really uh, builds a patrimony of friendship and relationships. Since the first time I taught here many years ago, I have an army of wonderful ex-students that have gone on to do fabulous things. You know, I'm thinking, for instance, Nu Nguyen, who, whom I bumped into in Los Angeles, where she became a, a very well-known curator. Or I'm thinking of Julian Rose, who was an undergrad that actually wanted to take the seminars, and he's now a great writer. He was at Art Forum and now writes also freelance. I'm thinking of Carly Dixon, who studies aging in the world in cities and just talked at one of my MoMA R&D salons. I'm thinking of Caroline James, well, she was not my student, she was an internet MoMA, but she started the whole movement of women in architecture. And I'm also thinking of students, ex-students like that I don't even know where they are, but I miss, like Samuel Massey. You know, it's really quite amazing what you gain from being able to really speak to people around you. Now, people around you. Uh, it's also important to learn to speak to people above you, and that's one of my biggest problems. Uh, you know, I, I had to do a 360 survey, as happens every time you enter some kind of uh, professional development course, and I did this fellowship. So a 360 survey basically um, is um, a, an enormous annoyance to many people around you. So this agency goes around and asks people that work for you, people that work with you, and people that are above you, they ask a lot of questions about you and in the end what comes out is this kind of analysis of how you are as a person as a professional and what came out is that I'm really really good at managing down and sideways and a pretty much a disaster at managing up ways and uh, that's something that I would like to teach you learn also to understand hierarchy and to understand respect and to know how to move in the world uh, this is something that I still have to learn at my tender age and that I hope you will be able instead to learn really soon. But embrace fear and insecurity because they will help you if you will know to walk through them. And every time you have a reaction of panic, it's the moving through that panic that will help you really be successful. 
The secret of my success, yes, is fear and insecurity. I never say it out loud with a microphone, but it's absolutely true. And as far as insecurity is concerned, mine is wonderfully selective, thank God. So sometimes I'm paralyzed, and sometimes I have this kind of Wonder Woman audacity that comes up, and usually comes up when I have to do exhibitions. So even in this case, there are comfort and discomfort zones. And uh, my husband always tells me that I can make really great design shows, but I don't know how to cross the street. And it's pretty true. Sometimes I have a hard time crossing the street, and I feel much more comfortable with objects and buildings than with human beings. And, uh, uh, you know, I know it. I lose myself in ATM machines and park benches and buildings and uh, uh, paving. And uh, once, you know, Larry and I were having this tremendous fight in the rain at midnight at the crossing of 12th Street and 6th Avenue. I can be very precise. I remember the moment. And it was like really impassioned fighting. And we were talking about something really deep. And I said, oh, look. There's a new traffic light. I didn't see the redesign. Isn't it beautiful? And at that point, you know, there was no more fighting. So, you know, it's, um, it's good if you have something that uh, really completely transports you. And I really hope that you will find the same uh, kind of transport. But as I was telling you before, building allies and being able to understand the kind of team that you need around you and working with you to achieve your goals is extremely important. And alliances happen in many different ways, and they're very, 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 very necessary. Um, I had once the experience, well, once, I had several times the experience of acquisitions at MoMA that created a little bit of, uh, uh, of, kind of discussion, but the one about the video games maybe was one of the most interesting. The video game acquisition was, to me, kind of a no-brainer, and probably also to you, in the sense that the Museum of Modern Art is about acquiring the art and design of our time. Uh, video games are an amazing form of design, and it's, a, it's about it's a, our job to acquire it. So it was pretty interesting to go through all the motions and find out how they could be acquired. But it created a lot of stir, because many people, both in the press and also uh, amongst collectors, saw it as a threat, as if video games would devalue art. And there were really amazingly strong reviews that happened, especially uh, one, one critic at The Guardian in London that said, no, Pac-Man cannot be next to Picasso. And now there's five floors between Pac-Man and Picasso, but nonetheless, he was. And maybe Picasso at his time was considered like Pac-Man. But immediately, without even uh, having to say a word, there was a whole discussion that started with allies that I didn't even know that immediately understood that a real conversation had to happen. So it's really important to be able to create alliances and to speak to uh, the world and ask for help when necessary. But you know, one thing that is also very important to discuss today is the fact that not everything is so positive and so uh, perfect in our world. And even though I am compelled to keep a very positive tone to my speech, I also know from your experience that we're all aware that not everything is so perfect. We are all here because we believe in the nobility of design, and we believe that everything that comes from design is good. And I believed it too a few years ago. I used to go around saying that designers almost take a Hippocratic oath. But truth is, that's not true. We have been made vulnerable by design. Design has been used to, de to devalue our environment sometimes. We have been discriminated against because of design. We have been dispossessed, hurt, targeted, deprived, incarcerated, scarred by design. Think about redlining. Think about simply how you can intervene in the city and in the territories. I remember that a few years ago, I was really stunned by the news that the 3D printed gun had appeared, that a libertarian philosopher from Texas had decided to put online, open source, the files to print a lethal gun at home. And I remember that at that time, I was stunned by the news, and then I was stunned by my reaction. Because in truth, like any other product of human creativity and ingeniousness, 
things can go one way or the other. And I started a whole project because of that called Design and Violence. I looked together with my co-curator, Jamer Hunt, for objects that have an ambiguous relationship with violence to understand how violence has changed in society. Same. You are really active in your political environment. You are outspoken. You are always really trying to make a difference. Up to uh, I hope to see you do the same in the future. You are in the exquisite position of being able to sculpt change. If you use creatively your uh, potential to produce new exceptional ideas and to make for better individual and collective experiences and also to repair our connections to our social and natural environment, you will be successful whichever form of design you choose. If you will be able to push us all to take a closer introspective look at the inequalities that exist in the world, you will be successful. And I don't mean to use this as a down negative tone, quite the opposite. You have that power. You should forgive our shortcomings and forgive us as a generation for burdening you with such great responsibilities. But it is time to make amends, and I am confident in the abilities of each one of you. You are designer citizens, so you can really build a better society. You know how to design not only objects and buildings, but also behaviors. That's an amazing influence that you can have. Be a feminist. Be queer. Be inclusive. Raise your fist, demanding power. Support your colleagues chasing visas. Speak to injustices and discrimination in the workplace and beyond. Acknowledge privilege, yours and others. Pursue justice for the environment and for other human beings. And remember, most of all, to trace the delicate thread that goes through all of these issues. We live in complex systems and we need to know that we can act in different parts of the system as if in acupuncture. And your activity, whatever action it is, will percolate down into the world because your work is designing the world. The recent phenomenon of women coming forth in the discipline and beyond is not happening in a vacuum. There's a thread connecting the struggles of the past with the struggles of the present, and it will connect the struggles of the future. In fact, it is enabled by previous uprising in the same way that these uprisings were born from even older ones. We need to all commit to working on multiple fronts at once and acknowledge that we need to employ a complex system approach without ever losing aim or specificity. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I went to a talk in New York where the great Angela Davis was discussing with Patrice Cullors from Black Lives Matter. Having seen for an event that I did a few months before, her 1972 interview in prison when she was talking about the importance of violence to be heard, it was so uplifting and amazing to hear her say that what we need to learn today is to make connections. Connections matter, and designers and architects know how to make connections. As GSD students, I am confident in your efforts to address these issues and to lead the disciplines of architecture and design towards more equitable grounds. I very strongly believe in your abilities to be engaged citizens wherever this wonderful path you are paving is leading you. And of course, stand united in response to misconduct. Expect and demand respect. Expect and demand transparency and do not stand silent to injustice. And always demand action of yourself and of others. Design is action. It's not thinking only. And design can shape better citizens and contribute to 
not save the world. You know, I'm a little bit of a pessimist. I believe in the sixth extinction. But I believe that even though humanity is going towards extinction, we can design a better ending for our species. So the next one will remember us with a little bit of tenderness and maybe even a modicum of respect. So our destiny is in your hands. Design a great ending for our world. <laughs> and congratulations.